gang. It is December, right? I mean, is that right? Could that possibly be right? Let's check. One, one more month to go in 2020. 2020. Not, not like any of us really care to see 2020 in the, in the rear view mirror, but... Uh... <laughs> bye bye. It has been the most interesting year that many of us have ever lived. I'm certain of it. For me, for I agree. Me, I've never imagined ever navigating a global pandemic, but as uh, as things go, you know, our uh, our overall hasn't really been all that bad, has it? Family has navigated it. Food's been on the table. God's provided clothes. He loves the birds of the air. He loves you much more. Amen. December 1st, regarding immorality. Now we're into real problems. You think you think merely 2020 is a problem. This is a real problem. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even the pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? For my part, even though I am not physically present, I'm in, with you in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. So when you are assembled and I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not uh, with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. I, I'm writing that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? You're not to judge those outside. God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from you. If you, any of you has a dispute with another, do not dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of be, do not dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people. Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, you are not competent to judge trivial cases. Do you know that we will judge the angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those who, whose way of life is scorned in the church? I say this is a shame to you. It is possible that there is nobody among, is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute even between believers? But instead, one brother takes another to court and this in front of unbelievers? The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brother and sisters. Or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral or idolaters or adulterers or, nor men who are having sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, or, nor drunkards or slanders or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But that is what some of you were but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the spirit of our God. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. 
you say food for the stomach and stomach for the food, then and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual morality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall then I shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sin a person commits are outside the body but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body do you not know that your bodies are temples of the holy spirit who is in you whom you have received from god you are not your own you were bought with a price therefore honor god with your bodies now for the matters you wrote about it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman but since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty with his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may, be, you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Singleness, now to the unmarried, to the widow, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not be separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say this, I, not the Lord. If a brother and his wife, who is not a believer, if a brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. If a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such a circumstance. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife? How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? How do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them. Just as God has called them, this is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keep God's commands is what counts. Each person should remain in the situation where, uh, where, where, where we're in, where, when, <laughs> each person should remain in the situation they were in when called, when God called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you, although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who was free when called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. Brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Now about virgins. I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. 
but those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is, the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not, those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they were not, those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep, those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably toward the virgin he is engaged to, and if his passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does better. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes, but he must belong to the Lord. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. Regarding uh, mutual submission. Now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. But knowledge puffs up while, life build, while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came, <clears throat> and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came, and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a God. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you, with all your knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who lack the right to not work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? 
If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with nothing, anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple and that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. But I have not used any of these rights, and I am not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me, for I would rather die than allow anyone to deprive me of this boast. <coughs> Excuse me. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body for we all share the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that food sacrifice to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. 
Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I am referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal for, with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that there they may be saved. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Regarding role distinctions, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have had her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. <clears throat> For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. It is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head because of angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also is man born of woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? That if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Well, this should be fun. <laughs> It seems as if uh, some of you in the chat kind of picked up on the fact that this could be a, a lengthy discussion. So I'd like to propose that we uh, plan to stay on until 1 or 2 p.m. this afternoon. And we just work through this word by word. It's, a, it's an exhaustive study this morning. Oh, man, what a bunch of uh, incredible things. Now, you can kind of get a sense, though, can't you, that that Paul is in this letter responding to uh, a bulleted list of concerns that have otherwise been forwarded to him. It sure would be helpful as we're kind of unpacking things to see what the specific questions that his response is to. And we don't get that. So we have to, <clears throat> we have to kind of read between the lines, which is a little bit scary. And we have to uh, kind of uh, super uh, supersede culture onto the text as a way of using it as a lens to understanding the text. Because as a standalone, it's really difficult to understand outside of the context of the dialogue, again, only having one half of the dialogue, uh, and outside of the context of culture. Uh, but inside of the culture and kind of imagining what might likely be the questions, it starts seeming like it makes a lot more sense. Uh, let me go back up and we're just going to hammer through some of the big ones. We have the issue of divorce right out of the gate. 
And, uh, and so that was obviously a big concern uh, for, uh, for them as they were, uh, we'll have sexual sin, I guess. I forgot about the sexual sin. <laughs> we have sexual sin out of the gate. You know, a uh, man was sleeping with his father's wife. Uh, and here's something interesting here, just as a, a notation, is, you know, we often, and we've talked about it a few times at church, just the, the thou shall not judge, don't judge me, you know, I'm beyond judgment, you can't judge, uh, who are you to judge, all of those themes of not judging. I love this, this section of scripture because it underscores so perfectly and, uh, and very specifically that we ought not bother ourselves with judging those who are outside of the church. Uh, don't, why, why, would you, why would you expect pagan heathens to act like saved, sanctified people? Don't expect that. Uh, don't, don't hold those who are far from God to a standard that you yourself are often struggling to adhere to. Uh, let God deal with those outside the church who are not part of the body. Uh, and instead, love those people who are hurting and broken outside the church people. Just, just love those people. Uh, those who are inside the church who have got, made a commitment to Christ, uh, if they're choosing to live in ways that are contrary to, the, to that, uh, put them out. Uh, don't, don't even have dinner with those people. Uh, don't hang out with such people. Don't even eat with such people. Again, what business is of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those? We are called to judge those inside the church to a, a, a standard and expel the wicked person among you. It's very strong. It doesn't leave a lot of room for ambiguity here. Um, and so there's a, there's a whole piece there of just living our lives to the best we can. And, and ultimately, when there's, uh, when there's someone who's um, living their life sinfully and you put them out, the purpose of putting them out and to treat them, it says in other places in scripture, treat them as an unbeliever is, is to treat them as someone you're trying to win. It's to treat them as someone who doesn't know Christ and try to afford them a chance to know Christ, to really know them, but to allow their shame of their sin to preclude them from the communion of the saints and the community of the believers. And so to, uh, to walk that line of saying, you can't be with us and do that. You can do that. We're not trying to tell you you can't live however you want to live, but you just don't get to do that here. And you don't get to do that with us uh, because it's, it's contrary to the purposes of God and to the will of God. And so to expel that person from your midst. Uh, but you do that with uh, a whole bunch of them, not just, uh, not just se sexually immoral, but... Uh, you know, uh, you do that with uh, swindlers and uh, and and uh, slanderers. You know, don't don't have anything to do with those people. Uh, but then he goes on. He talks about this issue of of marriage and singleness. And I think it's an entirely plausible and realistic thing for us to consider that Paul had almost certainly had to have been married. Um, and I say that because uh, there's, there's no examples of Pharisees not being married. Uh, all Pharisees always were all married. It, there's, no there's, no, there's no historical example of them not being married. So a lot, of, a lot of scholars tend to believe that when he gave his life to Christ, his wife must have left him. And, uh, and so when he says in, in here, you know, uh, I say to the unmarried in signal, both unmarried and the widows, it's good for them to stay unmarried as I do. Uh, it may be that he's saying, uh, I'm not choosing to remarry. And it's really good to choose that with me, uh, to choose a path of sing singleness with me. Uh, but <laughs> if you can't control yourself, uh, you, if, it's better to marry than to burn with passion. Go get yourself one of those husbands, ladies, you know, because I, we don't want any of you burning with passion. Go get yourself one of those husbands because they're, they're a dime a dozen, these husbands, you know, so go, go find one of them. 
Uh, but to the married, I'm going to give this command. Oh, don't separate from your husband. Uh, and this is not God saying this. This is Paul saying this. He makes it really clear. To the married, I give this command. This is my command for my church in this moment. Uh, a wife must not separate from her husband. But if she does, if she does, she must not remarry uh, or or else she should be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. That's, that's my rule for this church. To the rest, I, I say, and, and this is me and not the Lord, uh, and he goes on, he explains how if your brother has a wife, that you should bring her into the family and, and treat her as a wife, as was the Jewish custom. Remain in this present state. It's, he goes, nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever their situation, choose to, where you are, live well and planted in your circumstance. And he goes on uh, about divorce and singleness and, and uh, staying the course regarding marriage. If anyone is worried that he's acting uh, honorably toward the virgin he's engaged to, on, uh, to not be acting honorably, and his passion's too strong, he feels he ought to marry, Go marry her. Don't don't treat her in in disregard uh, the command of of honoring and uh, and so then you get this mutual submission and uh, and how to live our lives kind of doing the coming under motif that we've talked about in the past and wow there's a lot of stuff isn't there I mean freedom is uh, is not the issue great stuff Todd anything that you wanted to underscore. You know, Mark, I know there were some there's some questions about head coverings and and some other things that, uh, you know, that Paul brought up here. And I think that um, you you mentioned it before. The, the issue of culture certainly plays into this. And I think that there are times when um, maybe, you know, believers have been guilty of taking word for word what was written as though it applies to today. I think that would be one of those examples where the idea of head coverings was real cultural and like steeped in the culture and the traditions at the time that I, I think sometimes, you know, when you said, you know, reading between the lines and we got to be careful about that. And that's, that's really important. There are some cultural pieces, I think that, that Paul addresses in here. But the one thing that really strikes me is this idea of freedom. We are free in Christ, but we should not use that freedom in a way that could cause someone else to stumble. Mm -hmm. So I have to be aware that, that while I don't necessarily have to follow this particular rule or tradition, so to speak, I may choose to follow that tradition or rule in the presence of some people, if it were to cause them to, to stumble or to lose their faith or whatever it would happen to be. So, so that idea of, yes, I'm free, but I can still choose in a manner that doesn't harm someone else. Right. And so in, in, in this case, you've got some really strong cultural things that are happening with, uh, with uh, the temple of Aphrodite, like we were talking about yesterday. And in this case here, Todd, you should take off your hat and give it to Kathy because we're violating know, right. all, sorts of, all sorts of biblical customs. I mean, you gotta, you, you know, you know, because, you know, we, but what was true is that you had all these women who were coming into the church at this time that were coming out of the temple prostitution system. And we're going to talk more about that over the course of Corinthians. And, and as they're coming into the church, there's uh, a, a sense that they're bringing with them uh, a, a spiritual authority that's not from God, a that they had been walking in this kind of, they were cosmopolitan, educated, really smart women that were prostitutes in the temple. These weren't just your, your run-of-the-mill crack whores. I mean, these were really sophisticated women. And so it was common in that, in that day, in that culture, for men to have one kind of man that he, woman that he would marry, and then he would go to the temple to engage in thoughtful dialogue and conversation about politic and and uh, issues of the day and uh, to experience intimacy with God through sexual expression. And there was all of that that was happening in the temple. Now these women are saying, okay, I'll, 
I'll come in and be part of the church because I do believe in Christ. But how do I live becomes a big issue. And so some of this was obviously speaking to some of that. And again, what, what you're speaking of there is sometimes in scriptures, we have what's called timeless truths. And, uh, and you got to parse out what would be a timeless truth. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Timeless truths um, versus uh, specific laws for a cultural phenomenon. Like you must go, you know, 800 cubits out of camp and dig a hole to bury your excrement. Not something we're all doing today. You know, there, that, was a, that was a timed issue for safety and cleanliness of the camp. And so you, that was a law. It was an important law, but it's not really a law that we should embrace today. And so there's, there's things you have to say, okay, what was being given by God for the God's people forever? And, uh, and perhaps uh, wearing a ball cap isn't as big of a deal as some want to make it out to be. And having your hair uh, braided and wearing gold jewelry, we haven't even talked about that yet. Uh, we'll come to that, but maybe that's more of a, uh, hey, uh, ladies, don't look like hookers and act like that's okay in the church. Stop it, um, you know, and sit down, shut up, and listen to your husbands, which is kind of what Paul says, um, but we'll get on to that. He'll, we'll come. <laughs> There's more to come. <laughs> There's more to come, uh, but I guess in, in light of the fact that we may not really stay till one o'clock, it looks like we're done and, and we're out of time. And Kathy, why don't you pray us on home with your head uncovered? All righty. Well, dear Lord, we just thank you for this day, uh, for the people that attend here at the morning reading, Bible reading, and for all of our concerns that we have. Um, with sickness and um, um, economic concerns and political concerns and uh, family concerns and just so many things. Uh, give us the joy of the Lord. Help us to trust you to help us in these situations and fill us with uh, an undivided um, affection and uh, zeal for you, Lord. Help us to draw close to you today and during this time. And we just pray this, uh, especially for the Linder family and for all of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Well, you know what? I'm going to hold the questions from the chat until we get into a few other of Paul's letters because we'll this, this will cycle back around two more times. And so uh, we'll hold that for when it comes back around and when we get into uh, Ephesus and and Titus so all right gang we don't want to give all the good stuff in one foul swoop god bless you have a great day oh hey wait a second one more thing Todd before we roll out of here um you've got a small group that you're looking to start do you want to say a couple quick things about it oh yeah just real quick tonight at 6 30 if you're interested if you go to the website you can click on uh, there's a link for the 28 day um prayer journey and uh mark actually has some personal history with with it sounds like with crystal hurst evans who is the the author and the presenter of this and doing this as a as a f five week only on tuesday nights in preparation for what's coming up in january which is a strong emphasis on prayers do you ever wonder if you are praying enough that if you're actually spending enough time with God where he can hear about the little details of your day, not just when there's a big thing where you need him to come through for you, do you ever struggle with finding time to pray because life is busy? I mean, listen, look at where we are. I'd pray all the time if I could come to the ocean and have the waves in the background and block out all of life's every day. But the reality is you've got your job, you've got your kids, you've got school, you've got community, you've got responsibility. And in all of that, you're trying to make room to talk to God. And maybe you're like me and feel guilty every now and then that you don't do as much as you should. Listen, you're not by yourself. I want you to know though, that when you decide to make prayer a priority, to pray without ceasing, just like you breathe without ceasing, there's a lot less pressure about prayer than you might think. 
You have a God who created all of this beauty, who's waiting to talk to you wherever you are, whenever you want to, and that's good news. So if you'd like to, if you'd like to join, if you can't make it tonight, that's okay because you know, we're going to do it for five weeks. I see Judy asked the question, but yeah, please join. I think it's going to be uh, the, the little bit of preparation I've done. It's going to be a great study. So love to have you join us if you're able and uh, we'll it's go from there. Good. It's going to be a great series. All right, gang, make it a great day. And uh, Have a great day. Yeah. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.